Want to learn what sets LiveFlow apart from thousands of other QuickBooks Online apps? Do you want to learn how LiveFlow saves time for hundreds of accountants and bookkeepers? Want to learn how LiveFlow helps accountants and bookkeepers to use LiveFlow successfully in their firm? Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, LiveFlow, later in the episode. There's lots of options now, and unfortunately, most accounting programs just steer people toward one path, which is CPA, big accounting firms, lots and lots of hours, you know, and that is no longer the only path. It used to be, it no longer is now, especially if you can learn, if you can teach yourself stuff, like if you can learn those spreadsheet skills and you can learn those uh, app skills, it's way more important to be able to demonstrate ability and knowledge. Like skills are more important than they ever were. Coming to you weekly from the OnPay Recording Studio, this is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Are you standing this week, Blake? I am standing this I week, yes. You, you had a little swing when the music was going on. I That's right. I've been on an exercise kick, so I'm trying to keep it going. All right. I'm trying That's to good. stay mobile. I have not been exercising. You start to get old and things hurt and break, and then you kind of get off the horse. I have to get back on again. Um, I have an important it, question for you, David, before yes. we get started, which is, did you get your car? So believe it or not, believe it or not, Wednesday night, my wife got a weird email from Ford. Well, actually, I noticed last week the dates vanished off of the website. The, the expected the dates. dates. They vanished maybe Thursday night uh-huh. or Friday night. And I was like, oh, God, I hope my wife does not see this. <laughs> Well, okay, so for those who haven't followed the journey, you ordered a Ford Mach-E a while uh, ago, Christmas months ago. of last year. Okay, and you've been waiting for it So patiently. first, we knew the supply chain it takes yeah. while for it to get into production. Then you had to compromise, like, all right, we're, we're okay if you pull out one of the computer chips or you don't, you ship it without it. Like, so you have to make some concessions. And they finally build the car. It was built, like, end of May. Right? It was or May 24th, yeah, yeah. it was built, and then they said it was shipping. We expected it to arrive July 15th or whatever it was supposed to be, arrive. And then we went on until late August, we finally got an email that said the new date is going to be October. After we yeah. went round and round, calling the dealership, I'm, I've been t- tweeting to Ford, right, trying to get this car delivered. N- the, the communication ultimately is the big problem. So then we get this weird email Wednesday or Thursday, and my wife forwarded it to the sales guy that the dealership locally that was kind of working with us. And he's like, oh, he replies back, oh, yeah, your car's here. I'm like, he might, I think it's been there for four days, five days, six days. Like, and it's just crazy you. to like how, I don't know if people are just overworked, but just basically customer service. So really, here's what I would like to do. I want to find the slowest ACH transferring service we can find. <laughs> and pay them. With and that. pay them. And be like, oh, just yeah. let it get sorry, stuck. your money is on the dock yeah. in Argentine, Kansas, and there's nothing we can do about it. Right, and right. That, it just every time they ask me where the money is, I'm like, it's still in the same spot. I don't have any updates. And or, or worse, I'll be like, I'm going to go research it and get back to you, and then never get back. That's actually the – but this is like – it's yeah. basic customer service 101 is kind of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. But in theory – by the time people listen to this, there might be a picture of my wife's new car, and I'll definitely try to play the Cloud Accounting podcast on one of the TV screens in there because these cars just have it. They're basically big TV screens, right, or big cell phones with wheels. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, see what we get here. Well, good luck on that. <laughs> uh, by the way, for those of us who – or for those of you who have joined the live stream, the phone lines are open. So feel free to use the call-in feature on Riverside. If you would like to chat with us, we'd love to hear from you. We have a lot of listener feedback, some mail that we've collected over the last few weeks. We could get into that. We could do that and have a review, so absolutely. You've got mail. All right, so this is from Stuart. He says, hi, Blake and David. I am a college student at the University of Notre Dame doing a project on Intuit and QuickBooks for a class. I've seen some of your posts on your website and podcast, and I figured if anyone would know about the future of cloud-based solutions in the industry, that it would be you. I was wondering if the cloud-based solutions provided by QuickBooks Zero and other comparable products is the future, and more importantly, how long will it eventually take before most small businesses are using these products? 
will eventually all small businesses use cloud-based solutions for accounting? Looking forward to hearing from you. Stuart. So David, what do you think? I can take this. I mean, I replied to Stuart when he, when he sent that email in. Like, I only own four stocks in my portfolio. Everything else is mutual funds and 401ks. Who knows what's even invested in, right? But I own Intuit Zero, Oracle NetSuite, and Sage Intact. I mean, you have to buy Sage and you have to buy Oracle, but essentially the four cloud accounting packages. Because oh, I'm, really? I'm long, long, long on cloud accounting, right? So that's kind of where my stance and view of this is, right? And the other thing I, I kind of framed up for him, I had this old slide um, that I used in some decks because Intuit used to release the number of QuickBooks Online subscribers every quarter they used to release that. And I had quarter by quarter an Excel spreadsheet somewhere. I don't maintain it anymore. And you could see the growth. And really it all turned in November of 2013 when Intuit decided to make QuickBooks Online a priority. And then they started onboarding 250, 300,000 online small business, small business to QuickBooks Online right? A quarter. And now I think we're at almost what? 10 million? I mean, QuickBooks Online's got uh, what? Take... Five and a half million zeros now at three and a half million. And that's pushing almost nine. Right. right? So we're, we're getting close to 10 million to 11 million cloud account. People on cloud accounting on subscribers. Cloud accounting. So how so, many businesses are there in the US? You know, like what well, is I, I think what is worldwide, that? Like, everybody counts this different ways. Like, I think I've heard numbers like globally, there's 200 million small businesses and like, you know, counting people with coffee beans in a basket, you know, I don't know how you want to right. count it, but I think like addressable, if you really take like New Zealand, Australia, um, South Africa, UK, India, Canada, US, like people that are going to spend money on software, maybe Singapore, right? I mm -hmm. think the addressable market's probably 54 million-ish. I always kind of reference it as like- Globally. An ultra marathon, right? A marathon- yeah. 26, million, uh, 26 miles, and arguably there was about 25, 26 million small businesses in the old desktop days when desktop only did North America or U.S. market. And now globally, the, the opportunity is 54 million. That's kind of where I'm yeah. at. I don't remember the exact numbers that I've seen, but I, I feel like we covered a story. It was a little while back about how in enterprise anyway, we were over the 50% mark with cloud. And I know that it's more than that with small businesses. So we've already passed it, right? So Kyle said, I was considering calling in to discuss the sketchy amount of R&D tax credit studies being pumped out by fly-by-night type R&D credit shops. You talked about this two episodes or so ago. Kyle, feel free to call in if you want to talk about this. We await the ring. Oh. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and read another message that we got from a listener. This is from Brittany. Hey guys, I had to laugh at the newest episode where you said AI and robots are going to take over all the jobs for the youngest generation and influencers will be the only career available. I hate to break it to you, but robots are already taking over there too. Check out uh, Lil McQuella, Lil McQuella, at Lil McQuella on Instagram. Not o the only robot influencer, but one of the most popular with 3 million followers. Thanks for making accounting news enjoyable to listen to. So I have a wow. funny, uh, news article this week that I saw that we won't go into all the details of it, but essentially it's talking about how robots are making your French fries at restaurants. And the fast food industry is going to implement X amount of robots to do all this stuff. And it could impact 3 million entry-level fast food jobs. And I was thinking, we now have the labor pool to solve the accountant's labor pool jobs. Right? We have There's now 3 million people that are going to be in the labor pool that could all become accountants, bookkeepers, IRS agents. The numbers right. are there now. But we got to train them. So I was just thinking about this this morning. How do we solve the account accounting talent crisis? The universities are not going to do it. They're too slow. It, it, you're not going to get people to go back to school, pay all this money. It's ridiculous, right? They're expensive. We need to start accounting boot camps, just like the software people did a decade or more ago, where they said, we don't have enough developers. We don't have enough user interface designers. We don't have enough product managers. We're going to create our own boot camps. And you saw this pop up, the coding boot camps. And I have a friend who actually did one. He was a teacher in New York, teaching in public schools for 10 years, moved to LA, did a boot camp, and got a job as a user interface designer and is working for like a healthcare company making really good money now. We could do the same thing for accounting. I mean, these things exist. I see the ads on Facebook all the time, like drive a taxi, be a bookkeeper. 
and they show <laughs> yeah. me how I can make $153,000 a year. Like yeah. these classes exist. Yeah. But now I have to come maybe, up with six or seven grand to take the class. The maybe class, not a but. scam like that, right? Maybe maybe <laughs> something that's supported by firms that need accounting grads, that they're not getting enough good accounting grads from the universities. They could support this. I don't the know. Firms I want to start in, in industry, the tech companies. Yeah. Yeah. That can yeah, exactly. Sense. And but, then they could pay, like if you get a job at one of these firms or one of these private employers in accounting or finance, then they would pay for your but, education. But why would any firms do this? Because I think we were on the uh, Intuit Account Trends podcast, and I think that came out this week and I listened to it. And you said it very, very well. If you're a partner in a firm possibly making four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year, what do you care about the upcoming talent crisis? Well, when Just, it starts to like really impact you, right? That's when you're going to care But you're going to be it. gone. Like you don't care. Well, that's the like, problem. Like, so, who, so, so who's going to pro- spend the money to develop this pool, these boot camps? Because what's going to happen is in the next 10 years, the problem is going to get worse and worse and worse until it reaches a breaking point. And that's when they will invest because they will have no other choice. Will they have any money that's to invest at a point or is it too late? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it'll <laughs> just be the new- No, accountants well, will get their so, bailout. Finally, accounting firms will get the government <laughs> bailout. That'll be it. Just hold out, accountant firms. Just hold out. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Ucollect. Are you still paying 1% for ACH to receive money from your customers? With Ucollect, you can pay as little as 30 cents per transaction. Ucollect has a two-way sync to both Xero and QuickBooks Online and gives you the features that the accounting systems lack, like installment plans, secure automatic payment setup invitations, automatic receipts, and allows access to other credit card merchant providers beyond the ones that come with the accounting system giving you more control over the service and fees that you pay. Sure, Ucollect may be new to me and to you, the Cloud Accounting Podcast listener, but Blake used Ucollect to automatically collect payments from his clients years ago when he had his own firm. For more information and a free 30-day trial, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Ucollect. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash U-C-O-L-L-E-C-T. Uh, all right, Kyle is calling in. Let's take this call from Kyle. Kyle, welcome to the show. Hey, first time caller. How you doing? Thanks for listening. Thanks for calling in. So let's talk about R&D tax credits. Uh, what, what's the deal? Well, a couple of episodes ago, you guys had a thoughtful discussion around the rise of R&D tax credits. And I think David even mentioned he had seen some TV ads for R&D tax credits. Yeah. And... Um, you know, as a as a as someone working for a CPA firm that produces a lot of business tax returns, uh, we've definitely noticed clients asking questions around uh, R and D tax credits. And um, I have to say, whenever you hear the term "free government money" being thrown around, uh, there's a chance for some sketchiness to be to, to happen. And I think I think we're kind of seeing that. Like we are starting to jokingly refer to some of the R and D shops, not all of them, but some of them as tax fraud as a service. Tax fraud uh, as and, a service. Yeah. That's our and, episode and, and name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that if you're the CPA, you know, think about who is signing the return, right? It's not a third party shop that's producing a piece of paper that says the government owes your client $100,000. It's, you know, your firm and your client are signing the return, not that, that other person, not that other group, right? You don't, you don't have a relationship with that other group probably. You're not indemnified by them, right? Like who's who's gonna who's gonna take it on the chin if there's a problem with that? And so, what is like fraudulent about these schemes, or potentially fraudulent? I should say, I, you know, just to like even dial it down a little bit from the fraud term, just mm-hmm. the the government has some pretty strict requirements in terms of what constitutes legitimate R and D and how you're supposed to document it, and it seems unlikely to me that a quick API poll from your Gusto payroll will give you all of the documentation that you need to defend yourself during an IRS audit. So that that's the generous view of work being done quickly, supposedly automatically without the, perhaps the level of diligence that a CPA who knows what they're doing would do. Right. right? And they can and then, do this because they aren't ultimately taking responsibility for the filing. So, and they're correct. taking a cut like a lot of these shops are taking a percentage of the some of fee. them take some of them take twenty percent. Wow! And what is the average R and D? Are we talking? Are we talking R and D tax credits here? Mm-hmm. 
it's not well published, but it's probably around fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so each one of these for a shop that's taking twenty percent is a ten thousand dollar bill. With, with really right. limited risk because they're not signing the return. Right. But even bigger, like a lot of these startups, you know, if they're doing all they've hired so far as engineers, you have 10 engineers, you have a million dollar payroll, somebody's pulling out $110,000 to provide the service to you. Like, so, so it's sell as many as possible because as soon as you get any win, it's highly, highly profitable. There's so much revenue if you're taking a piece of the action. So Kyle, you're at a CPA firm and, you, and do, you, do you guys do R&D? So we do R&D tax credits. We're, it's one of our lines of business. Uh, and we do not accept outside R&D tax credits. And it's, a, a, first of all, because it would be competitive with the line of service we can mm -hmm. do. Secondly, we feel confident that we are following the rules and regulations here. And, and third, because we don't want to take on the, we, we do not want to take on the liability of one of these things being wrong. I mean, we have seen some pretty egregious quotes from R&D puppy mills saying things like- Puppy you know, mills. We, 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 we had a we had a client that had, you know, I'm going to extrapolate this a little bit to make it anonymous, but so you have $15,000 in total expenses in their first year. And the uh, R&D shop was saying that that whole thing can be counted as qualified R&D, even though it included stuff like CEO salary and overseas labor and, and things that like, no chance in hell are, should be included as qualified R&D. So we see, some, we see some things that are pretty aggressive. And again, I think CPAs who are doing tax returns for businesses need to be wary of someone who brings them a, a client who brings them a piece of paper from some third party that you've never heard of that says all of a sudden the IRS owes them a bunch of money. And Ray, who's in the stream in the chat, said, then the scammers close shop and can't be found or they put all the indemnification in their engagement letter agreements. Yeah. I mean, so uh. you know, I think the worst case scenario is, I, I don't remember when he talked about it, but a, a while ago, you guys talked about the Alliant subpoena issue. Did you, you talked about that? Alliant group yeah. got raided by the IRS. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And that's kind of worst case scenario where you're a CPA firm preparing tax returns. And why, you know, some of your clients have given you, a, a, you know, 67, 65 from Alliant. And all of a sudden now you're getting subpoenaed because of it. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, that would be nuts. Um, and so, you know, just, just imagine like a, you know, IRS, might be understaffed, but they're not like stupid. So as soon as a smart IRS agent discovers a couple of sketchy looking R&D studies from a particular firm, they're probably going to go and, and do the same thing. They're probably going to go out and, uh, you know, try to <laughs> subpoena all the poor CPAs who who produce returns using those things, you know? Yeah. I mean, so they're probably fighting all these companies already, right? At this point. Now, are you also seeing, Kyle, an influx of uh, employee retention credit people? Because I've seen a lot of commercials for that as well. Like, oh, it's so easy. You can just get this money. Are you starting to see, like, because basically I think these ads are reaching small business owners before you have discussions with your clients about it. Is that a correct assumption? We, uh, we do see people asking about that. And, um, you know, we we believe we're able to guide them to an appropriate number for those that are qualified, right? We, we put the work in to, to do it right. But um, it's def there's definitely interest there. I mean, I would say a thing that we've noticed that's changed is that uh, uh, folks are now aware of the term tax credits, right? It's, it's they're, they're actually searching for those terms online and they'll bring them up in discussions, whereas five years ago, it wasn't something people really thought about. And for those who haven't heard one of these pitches or gotten one of these phone calls, we actually got one on our Cloud Accounting Podcast listener voicemail line. So I want to play this for you. This is what your small business clients might be getting. Hi, this is Kristen Stewart. Today is September 7th. I'm not sure if you've spoken to an assigned agent yet regarding your available employee retention credits under the CARES Act. But I do see our pre-qualification is up to $26,000 per employee with no repayment necessary. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep this in pending status for you. If you have about five minutes for me today, give me a call back and I can go over the details with you as well as the benefits. My number is 866. I'm not going to play the whole number. <laughs> you want to do this live? Well, so David, $26,000 per employee. I so mean, I have three W-2 employees on the payroll. There we go. But do you qualify? Again? Like, when did you start? You did. When did you start the business? When did we start the cloud accounting uh, podcast? Twenty seventeen. Yeah, but right, we, well, my, my have, yeah. have fun in, in federal prison. I guess I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kyle, thanks for that. Anything else you want to share with us? 
No, you're doing a great job, guys. Thank you. All Thanks right. You. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for calling in. Right. Have a good one. Uh, well, that's great. Um, and Ray said in the chat, like all tax stuff, there are complex rules that must be followed. R&D credits, PPP, ERC, CTC, EITC, et cetera. It's been this way for decades and always will be. And unfortunately, it's kind of easy these days to skip out on following those complex rules. It's the golden age of fraud, as our friends over on the Oh My Fraud podcast uh, like to say, because we've got so many opportunities to commit it and not a lot of enforcement, right? Under-resourced teams that just can't investigate all of this fraud. Yeah. I got a story about fraud for this episode. Uh, there's an update on pandemic fraud. I know we all love hearing about just how much money is this the big arrest? Because I, I I heard this early in the week on NPR. There was this huge fraud. And then I was like, oh, it'll be in my news articles. And I didn't see it come through because I think it's not directly PPP, but it's pandemic-related fraud. Is this the one you're talking about? $45.6 billion may this have been This is the stolen. one. Okay, cool. Thank okay. you. Fill me in now. Since well, well, so I've this is not one it. single fraud. This is just an aggregate. Uh, the estimate is that uh, $45.6 billion was stolen from U.S. unemployment insurance programs during the pandemic. And it was intended to help people laid off during the COVID-19 pandemic, but fraudsters used social security numbers of people who were dead or in prison and filed for unemployment in multiple states. This is from the Labor Department's Inspector General. More than 1,000 people have been charged with crimes involving unemployment insurance fraud since March 2020. But are they gonna catch them all? I think slim chance to none, right? I found the article I was talking about. Different one? The, so the U.S. Attorney General announces federal charges against 47 defendants in a $250 million Feeding Our Future fraud scheme. So there was a nonprofit called Feeding Our Future, plus they had about 200 other quote-unquote meal sites in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, and they basically have perpetrated the largest COVID-19 fraud in the nation. So 47 people have, uh, have charges against them. Wow. Across six separate indictments and three criminal informations with charges of conspiracy, wire fraud, money laundering, and bribery. So I'll get this in the show notes for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I got more fraud stories. Let's just go through them real quick. Crypto King has luxury cars seized after 35 million vanishes. This is apparently the Crypto King of Canada. Five luxury cars, including two BMWs, two McLarens, and a Lamborghini have been seized from 23-year-old Aiden Vlaterski, the self-described Crypto King of Canada, during bankruptcy proceedings, according to a new report from the CBC. So apparently he took $35 million and it's not even clear if he ever actually invested the money. <laughs> it was just a total scam. And he um, he paid news publications to print articles about him, like sponsored content kind of articles <laughs> that then like led people to want to invest with him. Yeah. Um, the SEC has charged a technology company with revenue manipulation. So now we're going from you know, uh, just stealing money to manipulating earnings. This caught my attention because it was uh, a company that I have purchased products from VMware. You know VMware, David? Very familiar with VMware. Used it a yeah, lot yeah. in the old uh, desktop QuickBooks quality assurance days to testing. It was great. It's, Loved it. Yeah, because you can virtualize uh, software in the cloud yeah. on your you desktop. Take snapshots of it. So if you're doing testing, it was good. You could like, snapshot a computer exactly where you needed it and then rewind it, basically, if you need to. Well, they have been charged by the SEC, and uh, they have settled. According to the SEC, starting in 2019, they would delay the delivery of license keys on some sales orders until just after the quarter end, which allowed the company to recognize revenue from those sales in the following quarter. The company did this enough times that tens of millions of dollars worth of revenue was shifted into future quarters, which provided a buffer in periods that they had less revenue in, and it obscured the company's actual performance for a given fiscal quarter. Their business was slowing in 2020 due to macroeconomic factors, uh, and also their switch to subscription-based license sales. That was hidden by this scheme. And basically, once the shit hit the fan, the company's stock price fell by 37% after, you know, like they delayed the, the problem. Right. You can only when you push revenue into future quarters, you can only delay something if that's part of a bigger trend, right? Yeah. So then they had a big cliff and then it fell by thirty seven percent. Now the problem is the real like the impact is that their their reported license revenue 
was increased by 11% in the first quarter of 2020 due to this. So like that's a material, very material amount. And they also continued to sell stock the whole time. So they were selling stock at an inflated value based on fake earnings, right? And or excel is VMware a public company still? Or again, I know they've went public I mean, private. I don't know where they're at If now. the SEC is uh, charging them of this, then yeah. So, so they've had to have somebody audit these financial reports and sign off on them? Where were the auditors, right? <laughs> you always wonder about that. Uh, so here's the thing is they didn't admit or deny the findings. They didn't admit wrongdoing. They got a cease and desist order that they consented to, and they have to pay an $8 million penalty. So that's it. Just $8 million penalty. And just move like on. you wonder, why does this keep happening? Why, why do CFOs and CEOs do these schemes? Because they don't personally ever, like rarely do they pay the price for it. Yeah. So, so I have a fraud story. All right, let's do it. So it's, I have homework for everybody. Pause the podcast if you'd like right now. You can pause. Go to Netflix and you're going to find a new documentary on Netflix called Scandal, S-K-N-D-A-L. Like maybe that's a German spelling, I'm assuming, bringing down Wirecard. So we talked about Wirecard in the past. Wirecard essentially was the big tech darling of Germany. They were kind of like a PayPal slash Square type company, Square app. They were really heavy in the prepaid gift cards. They had point of sale terminals. They're moving money around. They were really the Facebook or the Google of Germany because Germany always had like old industrial but they really wanted to have that tech company. And so everybody in the country was just so behind Wirecard, no matter what, and to where they had blinders on to it being a fraud. And so this documentary, it touches on everything. Essentially, in the end, they were laundering money for Russians. <laughs> and the Russians, it, it got, it, and it caught, you know, there's political Wirecard. ties. And everybody had, like, everybody had Wirecards. All the politicians, like everybody was just getting money put on these wire cards, where it's coming from. They're spending it. It's not trackable. It's not traceable. You know, they, they faked the books, right? And this reporter traced out, started this in 2014, calling out that they were a scam. And it took until late 2019 for it to all come crumbling down. And during this time, it got to the point where this money was being used to stop immigration or block immigration to get certain people elected to German positions in government, it created instability. So when I watch this, I'm stepping back and like, remember EY failed to audit this correctly? Because they just yeah, used yeah. fake bank statements and all that. And I'm like, here we go. The failure of a good audit, a reliable audit, is now causing political instability in countries and possibly the rest of the EU. Like it caused political instability. Now that one founder is still on the run. Nobody's caught that guy. But watch this documentary. It's got... Like people threatening, people spying. It's got it's got all the. It, it should be actually great to, for it to be just a dramatized movie one day too, right? Like it'll you, you could see it already being built as a movie like that. Yeah. But yeah. watch this documentary. It's right. amazing. Scandal bringing down Wirecard. I'm gonna add it to my Netflix list. Uh, Ray made a comment, and I thought about this myself. Our journalists and auditors, and I'm like, yeah. How did this one guy figure all this out? One journalist. <laughs> For the Financial Times, when and the uh, the auditors don't even bother to do bank confirmations properly. What I suspect is the auditors probably all had wire cards that were getting they, juiced up. They'd spend on it. It's not traceable. So where was the money coming from? Russian mobs and Russian. They, so they were like giving out complex, money, whatever. Yeah. 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 Wow. All and right. and, and then the, what what really set off the the go that things were not adding up correctly in this company. Apparently, wire card grew really fast because the U.S. used to let people do online gambling. And then they created that law and they banned that so companies can't move money on online gambling. And that was probably 50% of their revenue. So when that went away, the very next year, they still grew. Hmm. And then they grew the next year and they grew the next year, even though in theory, all the revenue was gone. But they just they were cooking a, the books. They were just cooking the books year after year after year. And it's, it's <laughs> just crazy that they're almost like that mindset of like, they're too big to fail. Like everybody yeah. wanted them to be successful. So they just let it go. Wow. Like nobody cared. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by LiveFlow. Think about this. If you have approximately 60 clients and create five reports a month for each of them, that's over 3,500 reports a year. And let's say you're really fast and it only takes you one minute per report. That's almost 2.5 days a year you spend creating reports. Here are a few of the ways LiveFlow saves time for so many accountants and bookkeepers. 
Once you create the perfect suite of reports for a client, you can just copy the Google Sheet, use LiveFlow to connect it to a different client's QuickBooks Online company, and you're all done. The new reports will pull in the data for the second client automatically. You can easily drill down on the details of each number on a live flow report, including drilling down to the transaction level to navigate directly to the transaction inside of QuickBooks Online. No more opening QuickBooks Online to search for specific transactions. Live flow and Google Sheets are in the cloud, so you don't have to waste time emailing files between your team and your clients. And you can give your clients access to a suite of reports that they can access anytime, eliminating one-off requests for you and your staff. To learn more about using live flow and how you can save 20% off your first three months, Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash liveflow. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash L-I-V-E-F-L-O-W. Stop manually updating your spreadsheets with Liveflow. I want to get back to listener mail because we got to clear that backlog. And Here's we should delete all mail. this wire card stuff because I don't want the Russians coming after me after watching this documentary now. <laughs> They're too busy. They're too busy. They're too busy. Yeah. Uh, let's take a listen to this. Blake, hey, this is Joe Rotman. Um, I just had to leave you a voicemail. So I, I'm um, in my 50s, you know, 30 year corporate accounting, you know, as a reporting person. And um, I just became aware of Embark and Cloud Accounting Podcast and that Fraud Podcast in the last couple of weeks. Just can't get enough of them. It's uh, so entertaining, you know. So, so, uh, you know, and then you have great guests. So, even more learning than just the boilerplate stuff you hear on the big four pod, you know, podcasts or webcasts. Not that they're bad, but this is really good in addition to those and, and much more <clears throat> entertaining. And so uh, I just, uh, you know, spent the 99 bucks and started and uh, really uh, enjoy the content, Joe Lutman. Thank you so much, Joe, for that. And thanks for subscribing to Earmark. By the way, if you're listening, you can get free CPE for listening to the Cloud Accounting Podcast on the Airmark CPE app. Download it on the App Store today. Shall I keep going? You got another, uh, is, is listener feedback? Are we jumping into other stuff now? Where are so we going? This is more listener mail, more okay, listener keep mail. Keep going, keep it going. It just keeps going. We got lots of listeners. Uh, this is from John Pierce. Thanks, Blake and David, for your outstanding podcast. I only discovered it about a month ago. The new UK prime minister was an accountant before she entered into politics. Just thought you might use that as content for helping us accountants not to underestimate ourselves when it comes to leadership and management. And that is from John Pierce, CPA in Sydney, Australia. That's good. We need we That's... need more political leaders that are accountants or understand technology. Like one of the two. And, and, and if you understand both, like, great, please, I'll, I'll vote for you. What was her career before... Let's see. Are she you worked her LinkedIn page. Connect with her. <laughs> I'm on. I'm on her. Um. I'm on her LinkedIn. Uh, or no, her Wikipedia page. If Wikipedia, if you're important, uh -huh. David, you have a Wikipedia page. Do we um, have one? No, no we probably do. Maybe we should. Any listeners uh, want to spin up an official <laughs> Wikipedia page for David and Blake? It would be great. So from 1996 to 2000, Liz Truss, the new UK Prime Minister, worked for Shell, during which time she qualified as a Chartered Management Accountant. ACMA in 1999. In 2000, Truss was employed by Cable and Wireless and rose to economic director before leaving in 2005. So a chartered management accountant. Well, hopefully she'll figure out how to get the UK in order <laughs> when it comes to their uh, budget, their economy, all that good stuff. More listener mail. This is from Jeff Goldenshoe. David and Blake, I am 51 years old and on my last year of school for my bachelor's degree in accounting. 51. Last year of school for bachelor's degree. When I started college at 48 in 2019, I decided to listen to every podcast I could about accounting. And when I found yours, I just had to go back and listen to every episode. Since I started listening in 2019, I haven't missed a single episode. And I thank you for your take on the accounting world. Most of the other podcasts I've found are all about growing a firm that you own and really aren't geared towards students. Even though your podcast isn't either, it really covers a broad range of topics and provides a lot of great information about the accounting world. I'm glad you started the Accounting Twins podcast because of its perspective toward people just starting their accounting careers. It's great that we will be able to listen to their take on the public and private accounting world. Although I know it's geared for 20-somethings coming out of college, I think it will have a, a helpful experience for those of us changing careers later in life, too. I have many questions I'd like to ask, but two main questions I have are in regards to starting a career in accounting. 
First, because there are so many apps out there that are used in the accounting world, what do you think are some of the main ones that someone who is getting ready to start their accounting career should try and get experience with? David, I'll let you answer that one. That's the first question. Then I'll get to the second one. So, so I many mean, apps out there. What what should they start with? You have to start, I mean, are you with QuickBooks? It's, you're going to come across that the most in most situations. Yeah. But fundamentally, yeah. if you can learn QuickBooks, you can easily use zero. It's not a big deal. And you can move into the other ones. Instinctively, you can start navigating between them and then learn an app that scans receipts and bills. And if you can use one, you kind of use the other ones. And then you kind of expand out from there. But in general, there's only so many ways these apps can skin a cat. <laughs> so if you, yeah. if you, or the other option is you go really niche and only learn the things for an industry. You go learn the toast yeah. point of sale on how to configure that and hook it all up, right? Uh, because that's going to be a lot different than doing a construction app, right? But in general, start with QuickBooks for sure. QuickBooks, and I would add, you know, the granddaddy, Excel. Take oh, yes. one Sorry. of those. The, the, I right, there's like lots of given. It's always like the given. But. Well, but not always, right? I, I feel like a lot of accounting professors don't teach Excel. Like, I, they never even spoke the word when I was in school. You know, like, so take one of those Excel boot camps, and those do exist. You can get really, really good. Pay for it. Pay for a high quality one. And if you are just like slightly better than everybody else in your office, they'll think you are a god, right? If you know. Uh, if you know stuff beyond like intermediate stuff, like what X look up and I don't know, V look up and, you know, like that's, that's like, that's most people's like max it out. They max out at that, like pivot tables and stuff. If you can go beyond that, uh, you will be very in demand. And then, um, I would also say, uh, if you want to get into like, what's the future of accounting, learn some of these no code tools. Uh, and by that, I mean like automation tools like Zapier, uh, Integramat, which is now called Make. If you can plug that in to QuickBooks and figure out how to build automations and automate your own work that you are doing as a entry level person, if you have to start there, you'll also be in very high demand because as we've talked about on this show many times, there aren't enough accountants, we aren't producing enough. The only solution is going to be technology. And that's where I think if you think about where we're at, if I go back a decade ago, so Blake, when you were the young person getting into this space and you were one of the early cloud adopters cloud accounting adopters a decade ago, 12 years ago. Yeah. I feel like that excitement and that personality type, if that makes any sense, is happening with the no code. Like the, yeah. the no code is the next generation of cloud accountants. Yeah. But in, in a way. And and you can go way beyond accounting with no code because you can automate all sorts of processes in a business. And yes, that does have downstream impact on the accounting and you need to have the accounting there. But you can get into like automating marketing, automating operations. You can become that CFO slash COO kind of person in a business if you understand it all. Like so that, I would actually say, uh, if you want to like have a real impact on a business, learn QuickBooks, but also learn HubSpot or Salesforce. Learn the system that's being used to manage sales as well, because a lot of times the people that know that don't know the accounting, and they can't figure out how to get things working right. So like the financial reports don't line up with whatever the sales reports and marketing reports are. A lot of marketing is just data now. It's it's funnels and conversion rates. And it's it's funny, like gross profit and a marketing funnel. It's the same concept in a lot of cases. So his second question is, he had a second question, continuing back to the email from uh, Jeff. My second question is regarding the CPA. Starting in accounting so late in life, is it really worth sitting for the CPA? I know it depends on what you want to do in accounting, but does the benefit outweigh the time commitment and the cost? Thank you for such a great podcast. Keep up the great work. Well, that second question is a big loaded one. Is it worth the time commitment and the cost? Does the benefit outweigh it? And I guess I'll have to take that one, David, yeah. since I'm the CPA, right? Uh, I would say that for me, it outweighed it. The benefit has definitely outweighed it because having... CPA at the end of my name opens up a ton of doors, builds a lot of credibility. Given what I do, which is talk about accounting, it really helps to have that, have done that. And if you're going to be working with CPAs and CMAs and EAs and anyone who has a license, they're going to give you more credibility. You're going to have more credibility with them if you have a designation or a license yourself. So that just is... I would say it's it's worth it. Uh, it was time consuming. It was expensive, but I think you can 
mitigate that. Uh, for instance, I didn't go get my fifth year of education at a master's program. I looked at how much that would cost and how long it would take, and I said, that is not worth it. I can learn this stuff myself. So I got community college credits, and I did it at Santa Monica College online. I, I did some of the cheapest stuff I could just to get it done with. I so essentially, in my... you played the game. You're like, I'll just get the 150 hours, buy study guides, pass the test. Yeah, like, you know, you underwater the basket game, weaving, You didn't really right? like, like, I'm going to get my master's in accounting now. And no, nobody really cares. Buckle down. Nobody, I've never had anybody care that I don't have a master's in accounting or that I have, like nobody even cared that I didn't have like an undergrad in accounting. The accounting degree is irrelevant once you have the CPA exam. So in theory. And the CPA. Like, if, that, if really that's the value, right, is the letters and the test. Like, shouldn't we allow people without a degree to take the test? If you can I, prove knowledge, if the test is right. so great, you should be able to become a CPA. Yeah, I've always thought that. Like, if you can pass the exam without taking the accounting courses, that does that not demonstrate you have the knowledge? So should we not allow people to do that? It seems like making them sit in the classroom if they already have the knowledge is a waste of time. And, and usually those are super smart money. people that learn really quick, and yeah. then they'll never come in our industry because- we turn them yeah. off, with making them sit through school. <laughs> right. We want those people. We want the really smart people who don't need to sit in a classroom and can learn from a book. Because those people can go start accounting. a startup and yeah. create a billion dollar company and billions and billions of value. Right. But well, you can't so do it in our profession though. Like, right. And, and so for people who are very uh, skilled, right, and have a lot of choices, that's what's turning them away from accounting is they, they go to college and they're majoring in some sort of business Thing, or maybe they start majoring in accounting and then they realize, oh, I have to do five years for this instead of four. Well, that seems silly. Why would I spend 20% more time to make the same amount of money or less money than I'm going to make doing this other business degree? And that's what we're up against. That's what we're competing against. And we're losing people <laughs> for that reason. So I say, get rid of the fifth year, let people sit for the CPA exam without having all this credits that they have to earn. If they can pass the exam, Make the exam harder if you're worried about people not being qualified. I, you know, like, so I, I don't get it. It To me, it's just a way for universities to guarantee enrollment into their programs, right? It's like, it's a barrier to entry and it, it just, it helps them. Well, they're scratching each other's back, right? The universities fill the big four, the big four scratches their back. Like, yeah, exactly. It's uh, What do you call it? The industrial, the, the uh, industrial the complex? Ed educational... In de accounting industrial complex. Yeah. I mean, that's that's basically what it is. You're guaranteeing employment for these professors. Uh, but then because they've been so secure, they haven't advanced the curriculum. And so the curriculum hasn't changed in decades and decades. And it's not what you need to know to be successful in accounting. They're trying to do it with the CPA Evolution Project, which is, you know, add some tech into the exam. But I've like heard about this for a while now. It doesn't seem like the curriculum's going to majorly change. Like, what are they going to do? Add one class? That's not going to make the difference that needs to happen. So, but anyway, like my point is still, it's funny. I can be critical of the the way the CPA is managed, but I still think it's worth it. Uh, but but also, I don't think the CPA is the only path. Like, you might want to look at CMA or being an enrolled agent. Well, there was um, what we covered that a couple episodes ago. There's like ten or twelve different. <laughs> letters you can get, right? Yeah. In this Lot, industry. There's lots of options now. And unfortunately, most accounting programs just steer people toward one path, which is CPA, big accounting firms, lots and lots of hours. You know, And that is no longer the only path. It used to be. It no longer is. Now, especially if you can learn, if you can teach yourself stuff, like if you can learn those spreadsheet skills and you can learn those uh, app skills, it's way more important to be able to demonstrate ability and knowledge. Like skills are more important than they ever were. And now we have an experiment. We have the Accounting Twins podcast. You can follow along on this journey and we're going to finally find out if getting the CPA is worth it versus not worth it because you have identical DNA, identical people taking two <laughs> different paths. Like we have the experiment. We're going to finally have the answer to this question. You can just go to accountingtwins.com and follow along. That's so. great. Se separated at graduation. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Lysio. Stephen Brewer and Company CPAs has a blog post on their site titled, Why Don't We Email and Text Clients? Here's the TLDR. 
Email is one of the least secure methods of electronic communication. Text messages can be intercepted. Emails and text messages can spread viruses, malware, etc. Need to protect personal info, name, address, date of birth, social security numbers, bank account numbers, etc. You're probably wondering how Steven and his team communicate with clients. They use Lysio. Lysio allows you to have secure real-time communications with your clients via a mobile app that includes reminders, task management, e-signatures, document scanning and exchange, and uploading, and unlimited storage. If you are ready to significantly improve your staff's focus, collaboration, and relationships with clients, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Lysio. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash L-I-S-C-I-O. One more. One more email here. This is from um, Sarah Work, CPA. Hey guys, I know how much you love cryptocurrency, so I wanted to share with you this little clip from a spot I had on the news last night. Colorado seems to be dialing into the virtual currency crowd with a move to start accepting crypto via PayPal. Enjoy. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna play this clip, David, because it's kind of cool. Like to, that, one of our listeners was on the news. In a story that you did she know, call us out on the news? <laughs> <laughs> a shout out to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> unfortunately, out. no, none of that. But uh, let's let's see if I can get this over over here. Earlier this month, Colorado became the first state to allow cryptocurrency to be a valid way to pay your state taxes. Most consider crypto a gamble, so KRX's Mark Bot went to find out how this plan will work and how it will affect Colorado taxpayers. Value is in the eye of the beholder. Tax manager Sarah Work with local accounting firm Stranger, Tallman & Louts specializes in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. They've grown massively popular since they first appeared more than a decade ago. But even with that growth, it's still a minority of people who participate in the crypto market. They may think that this is exactly what they've been waiting for. And they're really excited that the state is on board with allowing them to use digital currencies to pay their tax bill. Um, However, I don't think for the majority of people, the mainstream, I don't think that this is going to have any effect on them whatsoever. Cryptocurrency critics worry that the digital currency's market volatility could endanger our state's treasury. Sarah tells me there's no danger of that with the current plan, which requires you to basically cash out. So you're not technically paying for taxes with cryptocurrency. You're selling your cryptocurrency using the PayPal app and then paying immediately with the dollars received. This may make the new payment method safe for the state, but Sarah is worried that anyone who takes advantage of the crypto payment plan may face unexpected costs. You may be paying taxes with cryptocurrency, but you're also incurring a tax, actually. If you have capital gains on the basically the sale of that cryptocurrency in order to pay your taxes, you are creating basically a registered gain on the sale of your cryptocurrency, if uh, if in fact you do have a gain, so. Governor Polis has bragged about the move, proclaiming Colorado as tech forward. And even though the change is revolutionary, for now, it comes at a cost for anyone hoping to use it. On top of the taxes and possible capital gains taxes, you'll pay the Department of Revenue an additional $1 charge, plus 1.83% of the total amount needed to cover taxes and fees. Sarah has one last piece of advice for anyone interested in crypto. I caution everyone who's interested in cryptocurrency, please invest with care and only invest what you can afford to lose. It is gambling. First on the Western Slope, Mark Bot, KREX 5 News. So there's two things there that are ridiculous about this whole thing. <laughs> Number one, you're not actually paying your taxes with crypto. It's BS. No, this because... is just a, um, uh, a headline grabber announcement. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're just going on PayPal and you're converting your crypto into US dollars and then paying the state. They're just automating that conversion and they're taking a crazy fee. They're taking one point something percent, like closer to 2%. To facilitate the transaction. Yeah, every time you move money into Bitcoin and out of crypto, like ten people get a piece of the action. It's very like it's, expensive. It's, it really, it really trickles down quickly. And this is the problem with crypto. Like this is the the problem is like it's not actually fulfilling any promise to make payments easier for most people. It's it's very expensive 
to pay in crypto because of these costs to convert. I guess the assumption is this, like you have a big, you're, you're one of these crypto bros, you got a huge tax bill, you, now you have no excuse not to pay it. <laughs> you just like, right? Like, like I think that, is, is it kind of like that? Like now you can't say like, well, I couldn't pay it because all my money was in crypto. Yeah, but the problem is, as Kyle points out in the chat, it's actually really smart. You probably will owe capital gains taxes when you sell your crypto. So the state gets even more taxes. <laughs> and then I, when you sell your crypto to pay those move. taxes, they get taxes. This is genius move. Genius yeah, you need move. some sort of Excel function to figure out what your actual tax bill will be after you finish paying all of the taxes this way. Uh, it's great. I have a quick review if you want to get to that now that we're done with all our... Might as well. Listener feedback. Uh, this review is five stars. It was on Apple Podcasts. This is from Walt underscore WV, not VW, WV. Uh, it's five-star review, educational and entertaining. Get to number one. Fantastic content. Thoroughly enjoy the range of topics and depth of conversation. Blake and David's knowledge of the industry and honest options about where we are and where we could go keep me coming back week after week. Really would love a podcast shirt. 2XL, please. So, <laughs> well, you have to track me down at some event we're at, and we'll, we'll definitely get your shirt. If not, just shoot me an email, david at earmark.me. Well, David, do we do app news or do we save it for next time? Because we've got 10 minutes. Um, is any app news like, there was not anything in app news that I would fight my life over, but I do think we should touch on the two Trump things. Okay, let's do like, that instead. So, because I, I, in my opinion, it feels like there's two non-articles here. But like we should at least acknowledge that this happened. So one of the things is uh, Mazars, Trump's old accounting firm that yep. separated themselves from him, are apparently working with Congress and they're handing over some documents. Yes, but, they uh, they reached a settlement to finally provide the Trump documents for certain years. Yeah, that they prepared. Um, but they want this. They just said Mazars is being very cooperative. They won't say what the documents are. Like, yeah. It's kind of a non-headline article again, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, then, and so the whole the whole thing about this thing is is like the question is, and this is what I think Letitia James, same thing, where that she's suing article, the Trump yes. organization for, is so uh, Attorney General of New York, Letitia mm -hmm. James, is suing the Trump organization in civil court for fraud, and essentially it comes down to. Is it fraud if the Trump organization inflated the value of assets to obtain bank loans and then deflated the value of assets to pay taxes? And allegedly, it's a lot, something like going from a $75 million valuation of Mar-a-Lago to $750 million when it came time to get money from the bank. And like, the, I wonder if that spread is going to be a problem. I, this is where I feel like... It is that, I was really confused. Like, why is it a civil suit? She's attorney general. Like, why is it not criminal charges? Well, and that's made- And then well, I went and looked at the difference. The, basically, yeah. it's this. If you don't have the burden of proof, you don't file criminal charges. <laughs> like, like, I mean, if you like, don't have the evidence- Civil has a lot less burden of proof. So again, right. I feel like, like, is this just constant chasing of Trump? Is like nothing ever going to stick? Is there anything really there? Or is it just going to be this constant- Right. You know, there's 220 page lawsuit and there's nothing in all this stuff to have a criminal charge. And then yeah. it just goes back to the reporter with Wirecard. All these people are digging into Trump across the board. There's reporters, there's all these organizations. There's no criminal charges. So it's like, I, I, I'm trying to feel like this reinforces, you know, the right side that this is a witch hunt. Like, mm -hmm. this is like, if there's real something here, make a criminal charge. Like, stop wasting money and these. Because this is just going to get tied up and probably no payout to be a settlement. Nobody's going to well, serve time. Right. So and it's that's, a headline thing. That's related to the criticism. This is political. It's not a good use of resources. And we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I'm not hopeful that, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not hopeful. It's like I'm not wishing for this to, to you know, for like a guilty verdict or something. But like, so I just I don't would, care. Because then let's just stop. Let's just stop. <laughs> Please just file the, find the criminal complaint and file the criminal charge. Like just, just figure it out. I don't know. It, it just well, goes on and on and on. And you know, we'll be we'll be gone and dead, and they'll still be doing this investigation. <laughs> well, David, that's it from me for this week. How about you? That's it. All right. Where can people find you online? I will be driving my wife's car and be fully connected, <laughs> the electric vehicle. But uh, I'm at David Leary. I'm at Blake T. Oliver. 
You can also send us a voicemail, Blake at BlakeOliver.com. Send me a voicemail or call in. Join the Cloud Accounting Podcast live. We stream now. And the way to get notified of that is follow us on LinkedIn. Search Cloud Accounting Podcast on LinkedIn. Follow our company page. And you'll get updates when we create live stream events. Uh, We're also on YouTube, uh, Facebook. Um, We're going to play around with a few different ways to stream this show. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that. It's great interacting with you. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us today live and offered their feedback. And one day, we'll stream it live right inside the Earmarked Accounting app, Earmarked CPE app. Oh, yeah, and that's right. And, and could let's do it there. Get your CPE, download Earmark CPE. Each week, we release one episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast as a free CPE course. It's usually for the prior week. So if you watch this, you listen to this, uh, next week or the week after this originally released, go on the Earmark app, find the Cloud Accounting Podcast channel, take your quiz and get your free CPE certificate. And what's the latest numbers on this? I think I saw a tweet go out earlier this week that you have 3,000 members. Yeah. 3,000 people have used Earmark to get CPE credit. How many hours so, are you at now? Total? So 3,000 people have downloaded and signed up for the app. We call them members, uh, if they've done that. We have delivered 10,000 CPE certificates. So 10,000 course completions since we launched uh, the app. So that's a lot of hours. I'm I'm glad we could save you the trouble of having to go get those in person or attend uh, yet another webinar. Thanks to everybody who's given us a try. You should call them mem-beers. Mem-beers? Mem-beers. I don't know. Something we're trying, but I think that's probably wrapping it up. We're going to get cut off here in about 30 more seconds, right? All right. Talk to you next week, David. I'll see Bye, you. everybody. I'll see you in Sweet at Sweet World. We'll Sweet be World, recording yes, at Sweet World, uh, Oracle Sweet World, talking all about NetSuite, talking to the founder, Evan Goldberg, and we'll have some special uh, episodes coming out soon from that. Bye, everyone. Bye. Time for the classifieds. Hey, podcast listeners. It's Blake, and I wanted to let you know about a new show I'm working on with CPA slash comedian Greg Kite and blogger slash former CPA Caleb Newquist. It's called Oh My Fraud, and it's a podcast all about financial crimes. That's right, a true crime podcast for accountants by accountants. Caleb and Greg are going to come together every couple weeks to unpack their favorite frauds and explore the circumstances, psychology, and interpersonal dynamics involved. They also fully indulge in victim-blaming the defrauded widows, orphans, infirm, and feeble-minded, because who can resist? If you fancy yourself a trusted advisor, or prefer your true crime with spreadsheets instead of corpses, listen to this show to learn what to watch out for and to keep your clients, your firm, and even yourself safe. To subscribe, go to ohmyfraud.com or search Oh My Fraud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.